Swift on Android, Godot on iOS, is SwiftUI finally becoming truly efficient? And how can you boost your app launch speed by 20%? Welcome to your monthly iOS and macOS dev news. I'm Alexander Belus from Setup. Let's get started. Have you ever wondered how to make your SwiftUI app actually fast? Well, the engineers at Airbnb have been deep in the trenches and they've got some serious insights to share. Back in 2022, they started migrating from their own declarative framework Epoxy to SwiftUI. The upside? Massive gains in developers' efficiency. The downside? Performance took a hit. So they asked the hard questions. How exactly does SwiftUI decide to re-render a view? What caused unnecessary updates? And how can we control it better? In an ideal world, SwiftUI only re-renders a view when the data it depends on actually changes. But reality is a bit messier. SwiftUI uses a reflection-based mechanism to diff your views, checking equatable types by value, reference types and closures by identity, and structs recursively, property by property. The real troublemakers – closures and structs that hold references to classes. This breaks SwiftUI diffing logic, triggering unnecessary re-renders. The fix is simple – equatable views. Manually conforming to equatable can be tedious, especially in large code bases. That's why Airbnb built a macro, Equatable, which automatically generates the comparison for your views. And if you need to skip some properties, like closures, just mark them with Skip Equatable. The team also shares a couple of smart debugging tips. First, add a random background color to your views to visually catch unnecessary renders. Second, break down your layout into smaller, independent components that implement Equatable. Make your views really efficient. Have you ever tried embedding a game inside your existing iOS app? And no, I don't mean shipping a standalone game, I mean fully integrating a real game engine into your UI kit or SwiftUI app. Thanks to recent updates in the Godot project and the developer community, you can now just do that. Adding a game is almost as easy as dropping in a text field. Almost. So how does it work? Add the Swift Godot kit dependency, include LC++ in your linker flags, and make sure you link against the MetalFX framework. Build your game in Godot, then set up communication between iOS and the game engine. This is only necessary if you want to pass app-specific data into the game. For example, user state or gameplay parameters. Godot uses a signal system, similar to Notification Center, with support for user info. On the Godot side, you create a script to react to signals. On the Swift side, you will create a class that sends those events. Simple and decoupled. Once your game is ready, export it for iOS as a Godot project pack and include it as a resource in your app bundle. Register any required Godot signals object and initialize the game using Godot app view, pointing to the name of the exported pack. And just like that, your 2D or 3D game is live inside your app. Heads up, Godot won't run in the iOS simulator. The integration adds about 30 megabytes to your app bundle. So plan accordingly. Want the full guide? Link to the article in the description. Back in May, Emerge Tools officially joined Sentry. And if you've been following our updates, you'll know Emerge is all about performance tooling, from static bundle analysis to startup time optimization and snapshot testing. Now they've dropped something big and open source. Reaper SDK, your assistant for cutting out that code from iOS projects, is now available on GitHub. What sets Reaper apart from tools like Periphery? It uses dynamic analysis, not just static inspection. It's powered by two parts, a lightweight Reaper SDK that integrates directly into your app and a server-side analyzer that crunches the collected data. Here's how it works. Reaper tracks its class usage at runtime and sends the data to the backend. For Objective-C, it monitors the reinitialized runtime bit, triggers the first time a class is accessed. For Swift, it uses a hybrid approach combining runtime checks and binary metadata inspection. Full technical breakdown in the repo. Link in the description. And back in June, Sentry quietly released another powerful tool, Fault Ordering, core functionality of Launch Booster product. Fault Ordering helps speed up your app's launch time by optimizing how memory pages are loaded. It works by collecting a list of symbols used during app startup and then injecting that list into your Xcode build settings order file. This allows Linker to reorder symbols in the binary, so the most critical ones are loaded sequentially, reducing page faults, 
and cutting down startup time significantly. It's a small change with a big impact. And best of all, it's simple to integrate into your workflow. A new day, a new round of policy updates from Apple for developers in the EU. Starting January 2026, Apple is replacing the controversial core technology fee, which charges 50 cents per install after the first million downloads, with a new 5% commission on digital goods and services. No more per install fees. But developers who monetize outside the App Store will now share 5% of their revenue with Apple. There is also some simplification. The number of required entitlements for third-party payments has been reduced from 3 to just 1. With iPadOS 18.6, Apple is finally enabling alternative app marketplaces, just like on iOS. That means users will soon be able to download apps directly from developers' websites with far fewer scary alerts or deep settings changes. However, traditional web-based app distribution stays the same. For now. Apple also announced a new API, which will allow developers to initiate the download of alternative distributed apps. Yes, there will be user-facing alerts and confirmations, but the process feels smooth overall. And there's more. Apple is introducing a two-tier structure for App Store services in the EU. Developers will soon be able to opt out of level 2 services, including automatic updates, rating and reviews, App Store search visibility, face releases and App Store Connect insights. Are you ready to build Android apps using Swift? Yep, you hit that right. The official Swift.org website just announced the formation of a dedicated work group focused on adapting the Swift language for Android development. The group includes 10 developers, among them the team behind Skip Tools, a framework that lets you build apps using Swift UI for both iOS and Android. Wondering where to begin? The Swift forums now feature a dedicated Android category, packed with everything you need to get up and running. Step-by-step -step instruction to install the Swift 6.2 toolchain and run the first Swift executable on Android. Detailed notes and early insights from the working group initial meeting. One post you shouldn't miss. Pierluigi Cifani shares his real-world experience using Skip Tools. His studio successfully released three apps to both the App Store and Google Play, all written in Swift. In his post, he offers practical tips on organizing cross-platform projects and shed light on a real-world pros and cost of building with Skip Tools. That's all the news from me today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.